It's really good to see the ladies in red. The last time I remember going down with red shirts was to a, a, a meeting in Parliament with the Malcolm Two Garden who wanted the, uh, the overpass. And um, it was a great kerfuffle because we were in red shirts like a uniform and they saw us as a protest group. So the geriatrics uh, were sort of being tossed out of Parliament, which was a really great headline until uh, John Turner pointed out to the people that won't look good in the paper. You're tossing out geriatrics from two gardens. <laughs> but you remind me of that, thank you. <laughs> or a good time. Not that you're geriatric, no, no. <laughs> just the red, just the red, just the red. Change feet. Change feet. Probably the most recognised symbol and probably the most honoured movement is the Red Cross. You think about it. It's only been around for over 100 or so years, 120 odd years, and yet it is today when you hear about the Red Cross, it generally evokes out of most people a, a sense of, and a feeling of warmth, a feeling of help, a feeling of compassion, and a, a feeling of well done. Because it is an organisation that is truly well respected, and it's great. It is great that they, in their reason for existence, have these Red Cross Sundays and a particular time of, of reflection and being at church, being at people, and honouring God. But let's just have a little bit of a look about the Red Cross. We see a cross up there in the background, it's, it's Jesus on the cross. You know, and we also see the cross on the pulpit as something that's acceptable. If one of the younger generation came in here today and they walked in and they had sort of earrings and on their hanging off their earrings and in their nose, you know, with the studs, was a, a noose or a French guillotine. <laughs> or they had a, a t-shirt on um, with a picture of a noose um, or an electric chair we would think they were weird and bizarre and we would probably ask them to leave or we probably wouldn't want to be greatly associated with them and whilst the Red Cross and the Cross of Jesus evoke to us a sense of salvation and health when the cross was first used, it was <coughs> as a symbol of torture and death. It was the noose. It was the electric chair. And so what we are doing 2,000 years later, to many people, would have been an abhorrence. Because it would be, it would be equated to having, wearing a noose, you know, or imagine having a society known as the Red Noose. <laughs> it just wouldn't fit into what we now know about the Red Cross. But the Red Cross is using a symbol. And let's see what that symbol is all about. Now, a bit of a story up there about the International Red Cross Movement. Um, in 1859, Henry Junant, Junant went to to Italy, saw the fights going on and noticed that the wounded soldiers were just laying there. He organised the people to take care of them. Now I don't think he just stood there and said, you, you, you and you go and do that. I think he would have got in there with his hands, dirty, and started, and started helping the wounded and the other villagers, people around would have come in and, and assisted. It only takes a very brave person to, to try and organise a a disorderly mob. You have to have some sort of respect or something. I mean, I can remember years ago in Egypt, you'd go to get on a bus and it was just chaos. Everybody ran from everywhere. People were throwing their bags in through the windows to get a seat. Only for the other people to get in the bus and throw their bags back out the window and take care of the seat. So you could have been travelling along with your bags 
were left there. And we Australians couldn't understand it. So we just began to line up to make it audible. So we can understand audibleness. And so Henry Dunant goes back, tells about what's going on, and with the aid of a benevolent society then, formed the International Red Cross Movement. One person saw something, one person didn't like what he saw, and he did something about it. That was love. He did that out of love. Don't know what other motives, don't know whether he was a Christian, what he was. But he did, he saw something, there was a need, and his love compelled him to do something about that need. Um, and there it is, we see the symbol, the Red Cross. Why the Red Cross? Why couldn't it have been the, the pig elephants? Why did he have to call it the Red Cross? Why? Let's have a look. Next slide, please. You've got the Australian Red Cross, the power of humanity. Australian Red Cross is there for people in need, no matter who you are, no matter where you live. That's their, their credence. And Henry Dunant, that's what he started, that idea. No matter who you are, you deserve to be helped, particularly if you're in war, and you're a casualty of war. The Red Cross came about because the <coughs> flag of Switzerland was a white cross on a red background. And so to signal neutrality, he turned it and said, we will have a red cross on a white background. And that's how it came to be. It's been often taken to be that it's been a Christian symbol, a Christian organisation, and in many ways it is. And I suspect that, that when, when this was formed, Henry Dunant and the others had that well and truly in the back of their mind when they did it. But what happened was that other places saw the Red Cross and saw it as a Christian symbol and therefore couldn't, wouldn't take it. The reason being is that during the, the time of the Crusades, the kings, the emperors, whatever it was, that were fighting against the, um, the, 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 the Turks in particular, um, those followers of um, uh, Islam, decided you know, that they would go there. And the one thing they did was to have this cross on a flag. And they, that cross on the flag, the person that went forward, was going forward in defence of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were going to the war in defence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, if you were honoured and you were going to do that, then the king would, would set you aside and say, will you be the bearer of that flag and go forward? Now, at, the, at one of the Crusades, when the Turks had sort of been defeated, a red cross, a flag with a red cross in the centre, with lots of little red crosses around, was given away as they, the standard to show that, yep, this is, the, you know, that Jesus has conquered all. And so, of course, that became an anathema to the defeated people. And so you can understand why, in other countries, that the Red Cross um, was seen as not just a symbol of Christianity, but a, a symbol of an organisation or a people that conquers. Mm -hmm. And there were many atrocities during the Crusades on both sides, mm -hmm. and so you can understand why that happened. But Henry Dunant and others, they still went for it. Can we have a look at the next slide? Um, and so there was their own religious symbols. Uh, you had the red crescent moon in Islamic countries, the red David star in Israel, and the colour red on white background was retained. No matter whatever the symbol is, the red on the white background was maintained. Mm. Now, I'm showing off here a bit. <laughs> Down the bottom, that's the Chinese Society of the Red Cross. And they still have the Red Cross. They were founded in 1904. Now it's interesting, it still continues today, the Red Cross in China. The Red Cross in China really does fight for humanitarian and, and, and better ways. Remembering that 1863 we saw the establishment of the Red Cross in, in Europe, 
But in 1904, not too many years later, it was in, um, in China. And even today, it went through the Cultural Revolution, everything else. And what the Red Cross stands for and symbolises still goes on today. So we have a movement, the Red Cross, that reflects very clearly, probably across the majority of the world, of helping and compassion and helping those in the you heard earlier today, but some of the things our local group do. And I just want to say, on behalf of the people of Tea Gardens Baptist Church, thank you to the Red Cross people for what they do. But you know, the cross has really been a symbol of Christianity. It has been an anathema to many other places and organisations, but it's a, a symbol of Christianity. So I decided to do a search in the Bible on the Red Cross <clears throat> and see if it could come up. Let's just go, go look. The only place I could see it, find it, was in Exodus, where it talked about the painting of the red over the doors in, when the children of Israel were in Egypt and they were ready to flee, and the angel of death came over, and the red was painted on the lintels, you know, almost in the shape of a cross, and the angel of death would, would go out, pass over, and that would be it. The other part when I did the search, the red cross was, it put it backwards. It had cross in the red <laughs> sea. <laughs> And I thought, oh, that's a bit of a stretch to be able to talk about the crossing of the Red Sea and the Red and the Red Cross. It is, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> because I absolutely believe it symbolises and underlies what I believe the role of the Red Cross and why it was started. I really, truly do believe that. So let's have a look at what this was about. The crossing of the Red Sea. And Ethan, the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and they just escaped from Egypt. Tell the people of Israel to turn back and camp across from whatever the place was near the other place, between <laughs> Midgol and the Red Sea. The king will think they were afraid to cross the desert and that they are wandering around trying to find another way to leave the country. They had left. They'd come to a barrier. They'd come to the Red Sea. They couldn't get across. And God said to Moses, just let them wander around and let the king think that you're trapped. I'll make the king stubborn again and he'll try to catch you. Then I will destroy him and his army. People everywhere will praise me for my victory and the Egyptians will know that I really am the Lord. That sounds terrible coming from God. I'm going to kill people so everybody knows who I am. That's how it's written there. It's not really what was really being played out. It was God telling the people, look, you've hit a barrier. You're stuck. You're in trouble. Don't worry. I will help you. I will save you, is what he's telling the people. And then everyone else will really know, because of what I've done for you, that I am God. Against the unbelievable, against the impenetrable, I will overcome all that, and I will help and save you. We learned last week, we were talking about the important mothers in the Bible, and how so many of them, from Sarah through to Elizabeth, Hannah and so on were barren women. <laughs> and God took their barrenness and turned it into fertility. God takes the impossible and makes it right. And here it is. We have a reflection of what the Red Cross does. It sees the need, it sees the impossible, and sets out to turn it around. Let's read on. The Israelites obeyed the Lord and camped where he told them. When the king of Egypt heard that the Israelites had finally left, he and his officials changed their minds and said, look what we have done. We let them get away and they will no longer be our slaves. They wanted them back. Greed took over. As so often is in this world, conflict, is, conflict and things that go wrong are based on greed, selfishness, me first. 
So let's go back and get them. They can't get anywhere. We should be able to catch up with them. Let's bring them back. The king got his war chariot and army ready. He commanded his officers in charge of his 600 best chariots and all his other chariots to start after the Israelites. The Lord made the king so stubborn that he went after them. Even though the Israelites proudly went on their way. I'm going to get them. They're not going to get away with it. I want them back. They're trapped. I am the king. No one can dare stand up against me. Who can beat me and my armies? No one. Not a bunch of walking, well, I suppose a bunch of bushwalkers. Desert walkers, I should say. <laughs> They've got no hope. They've got nothing. Let's have a look. But the king's horses and chariots and soldiers caught up with them while they were camping by the Red Sea near P Peter Haranoth and Baal Zephon. When the Israelites saw the king coming with his army, they were frightened and begged the Lord for help. They also complained to Moses, Wasn't there enough room in Egypt to bury us? Is that why you brought us out here to die in the desert? Why did you bring us out of Egypt anyway? Why were we there? Didn't we tell you to leave us alone? We had rather be slaves. We had rather be slaves in Egypt than die in the desert. How often that when someone does actually come in and help us out, and we go on our way, and then things go wrong, do we get the complainers and the lynchers and the kick in the teeth? You know, it's just human nature, human condition. When things are going bad, we turn against those who are helping us, are trying to help us. It's an incredible thing. You know? Sometimes you wonder why do people do what they do when no one seems to accept or say thank you. You know, the Red Cross ladies and the Red Cross work here in this town isn't out there in the war. But imagine what it was like when people were in the war and they were doing it and they were helping them. Yeah, they would have maybe got some things. But sometimes what the, what the people do around here and how they help them, oh, you know, these ladies that do this, they're just a bunch of old busybody interfering people. You know, you hear that, you'll hear that sort of stuff. And it is wrong. <coughs> Out of ignorance, people go and say the wrong things. Do or say the wrong things because they don't know and they don't understand. Children of Israel, they took their eyes off what the big picture was. They thought they were going to be killed and buried where they were. Imagine being Moses leaving them out. You know you have a vision. You know what you've been told by God. You know what's got to be done. How do you tell people who don't have the same understanding, look, this is the right thing to do. What the Red Cross ladies do in this town, it is the right thing that they do, but they will be criticised by someone. But if they know, and as all of us know what we do, if it's what God has asked us to do, it doesn't matter what other people think, it's the right thing to do. And so they were, they were worried, they were complaining, they turned against Moses, they turned against God, but what did God do? Next thing. But Moses answered, don't be afraid, be brave, and then you will see the Lord save you today. Can you imagine it? You've got, no, you've got no weapons, no nothing, and you look up and there's this whole host of the <coughs> might of the Egyptian army, you know, the crack shots of the day, bearing down on you and you've got some blokes in there saying, don't worry, you've done it, right, God's going to save you. <laughs> I think most of them are saying, hang on, where do we book you in, Moses, which is... Which mental hospital would we keep you in? We've got buckets. Let's see. These Egyptians will never bother you again. Oh, come on, Moses, you really are crap. The Lord will fight for you, and you won't have to do a thing. Oh, yeah? Where is he? He hasn't been around for a while, has he? What's going on? The Lord said to Moses, Why do you keep calling out to me for help? Tell the Israelites to move forward. Hang on. Moses said, God's going to do something, so we'll be right. 
And God even rebuked Moses and said, Moses, hang on. That's not, what you're seeing and thinking is not part of my plan. I've got a different plan for you. If you really trust me, walk into the water. Go forward. Hang on. But, but there's a big big river there. We're going to drink it. We might be buried in the desert. We'll be you know, buried in a river. Don't go forward, says God. Hang on. Mm. Then hold your walking stick over the sea. The water will open up and make a road where they can walk through our dry ground. I will make the Egyptians so stubborn that they will go after you. Then I will be praised because of what happens to the king and his chariots and cap and cavalry. The Egyptians will know for sure that I am the Lord. Now Moses was told by God what to do, so it was pretty easy for him to say, well, okay, I'll do it. So I've the easy job, I've just got to hold the right out. I'm not the one that's going to be the first one walking in the water. <laughs> but the people believed. And obeyed. And responded. And they went forward. They went forward against the odds, against what their mind was telling them to do, against, you know, all common sense. They went forward. Let's have a look. At all this time, God's angel had gone ahead of Israel's army. See, they didn't know that. But now he moved behind them. A large cloud had also gone ahead of them. But now he moved in between the Egyptians and the Israelites. The cloud gave light to the Israelites, but made it dark for the Egyptians. And during the night, they could not come any closer. Moses stretched his arm over the sea, and the Lord sent a strong east wind that blew all night until there was dry land where the water had burned. The sea opened up, and the Israelites walked through on dry land with a wall of water on each side. This just didn't happen in an instant. It took all night. And they went through. <coughs> they went through. <coughs> Next. The Egyptian chariots and cavalry went after them. But before daylight, the Lord looked down at the Egyptian army from the fiery cloud and made them panic. <coughs> Their chariot wheels got stuck and it was hard for them to move. So the Egyptians said to one another, let's leave these people alone. The Lord is on their side and is fighting against us. The Lord told Moses, stretch your arm toward the sea. The water will cover the Egyptians and their cavalry and chariots. Even before they were about to die, the Egyptians realised how wrong they were in pursuing the people against God's wishes. Next. Moses stretched out his arm, and at daybreak, daybreak, the water rushed towards the Egyptians. They tried to run away, but the Lord drowned them in the sea. The water came and covered the chariots, the cavalry, and the whole Egyptian army that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them was left alive, but the sea had made a wall of water on each side of the Israelites, so they walked through on dry land. You see, what the Red Cross was doing, saw a need, saw the suffering, did something about those people who were casualties of war. We as human beings are casualties of a war. Mm. It's not the war of us versus the Egyptians or us versus the New Zealanders or anything like that. It's a war of principalities, of good versus evil, of God versus Satan. You know, that's the war. We're the casualties. And Jesus was the first Red Cross. He came in and helped us. God saw the need and he acted. He acted with the death of his own son. You know, so every time we see the good work that the Red Cross does, we should be reminded of the good work that God has done for us. And the question we have to continue to ask ourselves, Despite the odds, despite the barriers, despite the river in front of us, are we too still prepared to move forward? Because we can move forward knowing that God is on our side and he will fight against those who want to harm us. Next one, on that day, the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on shore. They knew the Lord had saved them. Because of the mighty power he had used against the Egyptians, the Israelites worshipped him and trusted him and his servant Moses. Okay.
suggests that's the one thing that the world does about the Red Cross. It trusts the Red Cross. If only the church had the same esteem and trust that the Red Cross has, this world would be far, far better place. The cross of Jesus was there for people in need, no matter no. who you are. May we fully understand our role of life and what we are to do in moving children. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the organisation such as the Red Cross, Lord, and your mighty thing for the people of this world. Lord, we also want to be reminded of and, and give thanks to you who not only looks after our material comfort, but looks after our spiritual well-being and our future. Help us, Lord, to truly acknowledge just what it is, the cross of Jesus is, and how important it is to be the central part of our life. We say thank you, Lord, for what Jesus did for us. Jesus bless you.